Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to everyone who's in person and also everyone watching online. It's great to have you in the house of the Lord, even proverbially speaking, for those of you online with us today. Um, before I begin, I want to just say a couple quick things. First of all, I want to publicly thank Daniel for continuing with us a little bit longer. Uh, and um, we're very, very grateful to him uh, and his family because he wouldn't be able to continue if it not for Kim's permission. So we thank uh, the family. Um, I've also been given permission to say that they are expecting baby number two right now. So, uh, so please be in prayer for them. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we are, um, we're delighted. Uh, uh, we get to welcome another baby recently. The Shadids had their baby. And so we're, 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 we praise the Lord for that. Uh, and continue to pray for the Mulgard family. They are in Texas. They're going to be there for a little while right now. Uh, Josh has a bit of a road ahead of him in his recovery, so continue to pray, but at least he has a road ahead of him, and we can testify to the power of prayer in this church family for sure, so um, amen on that. Um, and so with that, I want to ask if you'll join me in prayer as we, as we launch into this today. As whoever needs to take care of their car, takes care of that car. <laughs> I don't think anyone's stealing it. Father, thank you so much for, uh, for all that you've done for us. I thank you for, um, for how wonderful and awesome you are. I thank you that we don't serve a dead God or a made-up God. We serve a real God and a powerful God and a prayer-answering God. So, Father, I ask you today to give me the words to share this morning as we open up your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray this prayer. Amen. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Uh, I want to begin by talking about a beverage that I'm sure many of you are familiar with and like, and that beverage is coffee. Um, how many of you like coffee? All right, raise your hand if you like coffee. All right. Uh, there are 450 million cups of coffee served in America every day. 450 million cups of coffee served in America every day. Coffee is the most popular beverage in the world except for water. Water still ranks number one. But having talked with a lot of coffee lovers, I would say that many of you would probably dispute that. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but coffee uh, is, other than water, the most popular beverage in the world. The origins of coffee go back to uh, uh, Ethiopia and Yemen. Uh, and there's some dispute as to which, which country got it first and so forth. But the um, um, bottom line is it's an old drink, an old drink. Uh, it's been around for a long time, and it's exceedingly popular. But I have a confession to make. I hate coffee. Uh, I, uh, my mom was a coffee drinker, and she introduced me to coffee when I was a little kid. And, uh, and so uh, I, I tried to taste it, and it tasted bitter. And just to me, I just did, didn't get it. And she said, you have to acquire a taste for it. And I'm like, why? why? Why do I have to acquire a taste for it? I can just drink a chocolate milkshake. I already have a taste for that. You know, Why do I got to acquire a taste for coffee? But I've heard that from a few other people too. Uh, and now then she said, but you can have some cream and sugar in it. And so she tried to put some cream and sugar in it. It wasn't enough. I still didn't drink it. And thus ended my coffee tasting days for a while. Then I started teaching many years later in my 30s. I started teaching at Bethlehem Baptist Christian Academy, which is the same Christian school that I had graduated from. Jane and I both taught there. She taught preschool. I taught the high school. And, uh, and so while I was there, I discovered right next door to our church, the school was at the church, a, a um, service station that had a cafe. And uh, I decided to give it another try. And so I, but not just coffee, no. What's this latte thing? So I said, so let me try this. So I tried a French vanilla latte, and I found a new love. <laughs> so, um, and, I, and, I, and I began to enjoy that for a while, and then Jane said stop, and so I stopped. <laughs> uh, but uh, French vanilla latte, I can do with that. Uh, but coffee, not so much. Now, I think, now, my pastor, the guy who ordained me, David Stokes, would, would call that, and I quote, sissy coffee. He is a fan of black coffee, and it's got to be the real deal and nothing else, you know. But a lot of us, if we're going to drink coffee, we add a whole bunch of stuff to the coffee. And, and to, to some extent, people add so much stuff to the coffee that there's very little coffee left, and it's more the other stuff. You know what I'm talking about? 
You go to Starbucks, that's how they got famous, you know, adding all this other stuff to the coffee. Well, I would submit to you that we as Christians have done the same thing with the church. You know, there's, there's the core thing that Jesus conceived of called the church. And over the years, we, as God's people, we've added a lot of stuff to the church. And in many cases, we've added so much stuff to the church that we have forgotten or gotten away from what the church is really supposed to be about. And today is going to be a, a back-to-basic sermon when it comes to the church. And some people, you might be thinking, well, I've grown up in church. I've been in church my whole life. I don't need to hear this. It reminds me of two stories. One, um, there was a, uh, in a different denomination, there was a pastor who preached the same message three weeks in a row. Three weeks in a row, the same message. And a group of congregants had enough of it, and they went to the bishop, the superintendent. And again, this is a different denomination, Baptist. <laughs> you don't have anyone to complain to outside of the church here. Uh, so it's, uh, we, we, we are voluntarily or, uh, united with the Southern Baptist Convention, but we are not, uh, it's not a hierarchical situation. But this other denomination, very hierarchical. So these congregants go to the bishop, the superintendent, and, and they complain. And they said, you know, we're sick of this same sermon. He's preached it three times in a row. Tell him to move on to a different topic, please. So the superintendent said, okay, give me a summary of the sermon. Blank stares. They couldn't do it. And so he said, go tell him to preach it again. I also think of the famous coach, Vince Lombardi, great football coach, and he... Uh, used to start football camp. These are professional athletes, professionals who had been playing football for pretty much their whole life, even from the time they were kids up until they had been drafted into the NFL. But Vince Lombardi believed in the fundamentals of football, and so he would start every training camp by holding up a football and saying, gentlemen, this is a football. It is important for us to review the basics and remember the fundamentals. It's important for us to know why we are here. And sometimes repetition is the best teacher. And even if you have heard some of what I'm going to preach on today, and most of you probably have if you've been in church any length of time, it's important to review the fundamentals, to remember why we are here and what we are about and what the church is about and what the church is supposed to do. And while it's okay that we have over the years added a few things to the church, it's okay if you want to have some cream and sugar in your coffee, but we dare not forget what the church is supposed to be about. And if we're gonna add some things to the church, that might be okay, depending on what the things are, but let's make sure the church continues to be the church as Jesus founded it and as Jesus commands it to be. And so we're gonna look at Acts chapter two, and I'm gonna set the stage for you here on the context for this wonderful passage. Jesus has risen from the dead. He's been crucified. Three days later, the tomb's discovered empty by his women followers. Mary Magdalene communicates to the disciples, he's risen. Peter and John go check it out. Indeed, it's empty. Jesus then appears to his disciples. Forty days of ministry later, after, after commissioning them to the Great Commission and telling them to wait for the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, Jesus ascends back into heaven. So his 120 men and women followers wait in Jerusalem. And they wait for this comforter, this Holy Spirit promised by Jesus to come. That spirit comes at a festival known as Pentecost. At Pentecost, they're gathered, the early church, 120 of them, gathered praying in an upper room in the city of Jerusalem. Then the Holy Spirit comes down like tongues of fire and anoints them. And then they begin to speak in tongues so that all the people in this very diverse, cosmopolitan, multicultural crowd hear them speak in their own languages. This obviously, to use a modern day term, freaks everyone out. So Peter, the Galilean fisherman, the man who had denied Jesus just a few weeks before, now he has been forgiven by Jesus, he has been restored by Jesus. He has been commissioned by Jesus. And now he is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Peter boldly and courageously stands up in front of this entire crowd of thousands of people and preaches and proclaims the good news 
of Jesus Christ. Peter talks about the prophet Joel, and he preaches an entire sermon, and you could read that sermon in Acts chapter 2. He then calls upon the people at the end of that sermon to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And so we pick up the story at that point. In Acts chapter 2, and I, I did have my Bible turned to that, but it's windy up here. So uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse number 40. And with many words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward or perverse generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, according, they continuing dead, daily with one accord in the temple, in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added daily as such as should be saved. This is the launching of the church. Now, when, when you want to know what something is about or what the purpose of something is, it's good to go back to the origin. It's good to talk to the creator, the manufacturer. Find out from them what the origin is. Now, I am the owner, my wife and I are the owner of a Nissan Rogue Sport. And uh, this is the owner's manual. So when a light goes on on the dashboard that I don't recognize, and a light goes on, I'm like, what is that light? I pull out the owner's manual, and I hunt for the meaning of that light. Uh, when there is a uh, question that I have about the car and what the car is for, I can pull out the owner's manual. Now, thankfully, for those of us that are lazy and don't like to read directions, they also have a quick reference guide, which is much shorter. But for the church, it's important for us to look to the owner's manual, and that's the Word of God. It's important for us to know what the church is about by looking into God's word because God is the one who ordained the church. And so I want to start with that point as a premise because this is very important. There's a lot of people out there who have all kinds of opinions about what the church should do and what the church should be. Since becoming a pastor, I have never ceased to have uh, opinions thrown my way about what the church should do, what I should preach, how I should handle things. I am flooded with information and opinions. But ultimately, all of us should ground our perspective in what we do in the owner's manual, in God's word. And what's true for the church is obviously also true for your life. It's not about what you want or how you feel or what you think. It's about what he says. And that it needs to be the, the grounding for all of us. What does God say only Baptist church should be about? That is the key. And when you really get right down to it, nothing else matters beyond that. Our mission and our purpose and how we do things should all be based on what God tells us to do. What does he want? What does he say? Now, in Acts chapter 2, we see some things that happened as one-time events. We also see in the, in the Bible in general not only one-time events, but rare events. And then we also see things that are regular events. And let me explain that. Jesus Christ rose from the dead one time. That's a one-time event. Pentecost, that festival happened every year, but the Holy Spirit coming down in tongues of fire, one-time event, just once. The early church, you know, we read, when they were launched, they gathered everything they had, all their possessions. And they brought those possessions and laid them at the disciples' feet. And said, we have everything in common, let's get this started. And that was one-time event. Now that continued, actually that was a rare event. That continued for a few weeks and there were some problems with that. And Paul actually, in 1 Thessalonians, uh, actually had to, intervene on that because that was being abused 
and some people were being lazy and taking advantage of the uh, gratitude and, and are taking advantage of the generosity of other people. And that's when Paul makes his famous statement, those who do not work do not eat. So the, uh, the socialism, if you will, can work in a voluntary organization if everyone is committed and everyone's doing it. But even that should only be done when God says so. He said so at the beginning in Acts 2. We don't do that today, but I would say this, and we're going to have more to say about this at the end, but the principle of sacrificial giving remains. Even though God is not calling upon you, and you'll be grateful for this, God is not calling upon you to sell all your possessions and bring all the money that you have and lay it at the feet of the elders of this church next week so you have nothing. He's not calling on you to do that, but God is calling upon you to take everything that you have and hold it before the Lord with an open hand. That includes your time, it includes your abilities and your skills, your energy, your health, your very life, all of your finances, everything that you have should not be held on tightly, but should be lifted up before the Lord with an open hand. Sacrifice is the currency of love. And if God calls you to give something up, we need to be willing to give that up. The same is true for a church. So there are some things in scripture that happen only one time, Abraham being called to sacrifice his son Isaac, which of course he didn't, God didn't tell him to follow through with, but that was a test. Certain things happen only one time. Certain things happen rarely. The apostles, for example, doing many wonderful signs and wonders. You know, healing people in the dramatic way that they did. Now, God is still very much in the healing business. But you don't see Peter and John going into the temple right now and healing the, the, the guy at the, at the temple gate like they did then. So some of the things happened just in Bible times. Some of the things happened very rarely. But there are some things that are supposed to continue for all of human history from, the day, from this day forward. And we see those things in verse 42. And, well, in fact, we see it in, Peter, in, in the gist of Peter's sermon that sets up verse 42, which is a proclamation of Jesus Christ as our risen Lord and Savior. But setting that up, and it comes to the, the church itself, we see thing, four things that we're supposed to continue in. Four things that we're supposed to do. And if you study church history, you'll note that the first century church did these things. And there are still faithful, Bible-believing churches today who do those four things. So those four things are found in verse 42, and that's what we're going to look at right now. They continued steadfastly in, first, the apostles' doctrine. The apostles' doctrine. Now, the apostles' doctrine is what the apostles were teaching. Doctrine refers to beliefs. So the early church continued steadfastly in practicing, living out, and teaching, and understanding, and studying, and all of that, the apostles' doctrine. At the time of the early church, they had direct access to the apostles. We do not have direct access to the apostles physically today. Believe me, if I had the opportunity to turn the pulpit over, to the Apostle Peter, I would do so in a heartbeat. But Peter was not available to preach today. All right, the same thing is true with the Apostle John. The later, later as he's called, the Apostle Paul and so forth. Those guys aren't available to preach today, so you're stuck with me. But thankfully, you're not stuck with me, and this is important, you're not stuck with me expounding to you the opinions of Brian Tubbs. I am preaching to you today the Apostles' Doctrine. I am preaching the Apostles' Doctrine because I'm preaching to you from the Word of God. The Apostles taught the Old Testament. The Apostles taught the life and teachings of Jesus Christ, which we have recorded in the Gospels. And the Apostles themselves taught on the ministry of Christ, the meaning of Christ, that taught on the purpose of the church and all of that, and we have their teachings passed down to us in writing in the New Testament. So when I or Pastor Charles or Pastor Kurt or last week Dr. Ron Blankenship 
or some other preacher gets up here and teaches from the Bible, we are continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. But I see some, some problems today in the church, perhaps more than I've ever seen before. And that is most Christians today do not continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Most Christians today don't even understand it. There was a professor that asked his class in college one time, what are the two biggest problems in America today? And one of the students said, I don't know and I don't care. And that pretty much sums up the biggest problems in the church today. Most Christians, and hear me on this, don't know the Bible. Most Christians have never even read the Bible. Most Christians don't know it, and they really don't have a big motivation to dig into it. Most Christians, if you look at surveys, a huge number of Christians today are biblically illiterate and woefully ignorant when it comes to the Bible. A huge number of Christians, for example, don't even believe that the devil is a real being. A huge number of Christians believe that there's no real difference between the Bible and the Quran or the Book of Mormon. A lot of Christians today, based on survey results, believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. This is an example of the horrible ignorance that Christians have when it comes to the Bible. By the way, she was not, okay? So how can we continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine if we're not reading the apostles' doctrine, studying the apostles' doctrine, coming to church to hear the apostles' doctrine, how can we continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine if we're not committed to it? There are key ways that you and I can dig into the Bible and learn it and read it. One is just to read it. If, you have, if you're a Christian and you have not yet read the Bible, Read the Bible. You say, it's too long. Take it one page at a time. If it takes you five years to read through the whole Bible, then let it take five years. But read the Bible. Um, it's too boring. That's an example of someone who's never read the Bible. The Bible is a lot of things. Boring is not one of them. The Bible is an awesome, terrific book. It is worth digging into and reading and studying, immersing yourself in it. Know the Bible. Know the Apostles' Doctrine. It's worth it. And you can also get into a Bible study group, a connect group. We have connect group opportunities in our church. You can get into a Bible study group and study the Bible that way. You can come to church regularly and hear the preaching of God's word. These are ways that you can dig into the Bible and hear it and know it and learn it and learn to love it. And then live the Bible. Continuing steadfastly doesn't just mean studying it, but it means living it, living it out. James says, do not just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. The more you live out the Bible, the more you will experience the promises of God working in your life. And the more you experience the promises of God working in your life, the closer you will be to God. Now, I know that there are some concerns and reservations that people have about the Bible and about the apostles' doctrine. And there's a, I want to give you one of them, and I'm going to give you the solution to it. But there's many others, and if you have other concerns, please, I invite you to make an appointment with me and talk to me about it, or talk to Pastor Charles, or Pastor Kurt, or one of the deacons. But one of the concerns is that the Bible has been abused. It has been misinterpreted, and the Bible has been used to oppress people, used to justify injustice, used to hurt people. And uh, on top of that, now we have this society in which often truth claims 
are read through people's perspectives. So, you know, you have your truth, I have my truth. Also, um, who are you to speak to my life experience? And we've divided up society into groups and things like that. And certain groups hold other groups in, in, in suspicion. Uh, and we've divided people up into privileged and unprivileged and oppressed and unoppressed and, and blah, 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 and all this. None of this, none of this is found in the scriptures. And, and here's the deal. And I want you to see this. I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And don't just take my word for it. Let's look at the Bible itself. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is Paul writing. 1 Thessalonians 5, I'm quoting from the King James here. Quench, verse 19, quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove or test all things. Hold fast that which is good. Listen to that. Burn that into your brain. This is Paul telling you, don't just reject the Bible or reject the teachings of the apostles or reject preachings and prophecies. Don't despise those things. Instead, test them. Test them. So when, when someone comes forward and tries to use the Bible to promote injustice or to promote sin, test it. Test those claims. Now, I will tell you that the reason why there has been such abuse of the Bible over the years is because Satan works with ignorance. Most Christians do not know the Bible well enough to guard themselves against deception. Now, Pastor Charles Bailey is a really cool guy in a lot of ways. A lot of ways. But one of the uh, coolness factors with Pastor Charles Bailey is he used to, he's retired Secret Service. And most of you that have been a member of our church for many years know that, but there's a lot of new people and some visitors, you may not know that. So Pastor Charles is a retired Secret Service agent, and uh, he's got some cool stories to share about that. But one of the things that the Secret Service does, in addition to guarding the presidents, which Pastor Charles did, but one of the things, in addition to guarding the president, is the Secret Service guards our currency. If you flood the American economy with counterfeit currency, it crashes the economy. And many people are hurt by it. So the Secret Service works hard to guard our economy, our country, you and me. They guard us from counterfeit money coming in, flooding the system, and crashing the system. And the way that the Secret Service agents are trained to spot counterfeit is they become experts on the real authentic currency. They become experts on the real currency so much so that they could easily spot the difference in the counterfeit. If instead you study the counterfeit currency, you're going to become lost. But if you study the real currency, you can more easily spot the deviations from the real currency, and thus you can spot the counterfeit currency. Ladies and gentlemen, the same thing is true for church doctrine, the apostles' doctrine, the Bible. The church, over the years, there's no question about this, the church has been flooded by counterfeit teachings, false teachings, damaging teachings, hurtful teachings, false teachers, all of that. You're right, and it has at times crashed churches. It has at times hurt a lot of people, but the best guard against counterfeit teaching is correct teaching. We see this when the devil misquoted the scriptures and misapplied the scriptures when he tempted Jesus. Jesus did not reply to the devil the same way that many Christians do today by saying, you can make the scriptures mean anything you want them to say and then throw up his hands and walk away from the scriptures. That's not what Jesus did and that's not what you and I should do. Jesus responded to the incorrect teaching of the Bible with correct teaching of the Bible. Jesus, instead of the devil misquoting scripture, Jesus correctly quoted scripture back to the devil and the devil went away. Just as the Bible promises us that if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. We resist the devil by standing on the word of God and the promises of God. We resist false teaching by standing on correct teaching. If you and I are grounded in the correct teachings and the correct doctrine of God's word, we will spot the counterfeits. 
we will spot the deviations and we won't fall for it. The reason why so many people today are falling for false teaching is they don't know the real teaching. They don't know the real Bible. The best way to guard against deception and against corruption is to be grounded in the truth. Know this book. Do you know how many Christian men and women over the ages have given their lives and shed their blood so that you and I could have access to this book today? This is a precious gift that we have today, and we take it for granted. You should make it a high priority to dive into God's word. And then we learn from Acts chapter 2, not only did they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, but they continued steadfastly in fellowship. Now, Baptists everywhere rejoice and say amen when the word fellowship comes up. I am among them because we associate that with eating. There's a Baptist saying, you can't have a meeting without eating. I personally like that saying, but that's not exactly what the apostles have in mind when it comes to fellowship. Food is a great way to facilitate fellowship. I highly approve of it, but it is not, it is not the only way to facilitate fellowship. What we're doing right now, right now is fellowship. We are corporately gathering together in person and online, this is fellowship. And I would also add, there was a, I've used this illustration before, at a, the church where I was ordained, Pastor Stokes at one point talked about a family that had emailed him and said, we didn't feel, we didn't feel loved, we didn't feel uh, liked or whatever. And so he talked about, he talked about this family with some of the other deacons and elders, like, you know, how did this family fall through the cracks? And upon a little bit of investigation, he discovered this family would come to church late and leave early. They would come after the service had already started. They would leave during the invitation. It's hard to have fellowship if you're not part of the fellowship. You have to, Proverbs says, a man who has friends must show himself friendly. So if you want to be a part of the fellowship, you must engage you must engage with the people. And you're like, I've met people who said, I don't like people. That could be a problem. If you have an attitude, I don't like people, then chances are that's going to be, that vibe's going to be put out and uh, you're going to have a hard time connecting with people. Here's the deal. Learn to love what God values. God values people and people are messy and people will let you down, and people will hurt you, but people are valued by God, and God commands us to love our neighbor. That is a command. It's not an option. Love your neighbor if they vote the way you do. Love your neighbor if you feel like it. Love your neighbor if they're nice to you. None of those qualifiers are in there. Love your neighbor, period. And so, engage. We must continue steadfastly in fellowship. Now, that's been challenging during COVID. But I would say to you that the church has had to overcome challenges from the beginning of its history. And we must continue doing that. What is fellowship for our church purposes? It's just when we get together and enjoy each other's fellowship and company. That's fellowship. When we build relationships within the church, when we hold each other accountable, when we encourage one another, when we support one another, when we take meals to one another, when we run errands for people, help people, and support people, that's all part of fellowship. And fellowship must be done. That is something that we are commanded to do. And so you can't just, please don't do this. Don't just, well, I'm just going to watch the service online occasionally. I might show up occasionally, and then I'm just going to check that box, and I did my duty, and I'm going to go on about my life. That is not the church. Don't be a consumer. Be part of the fellowship. Be part of this. If God has called you to only Baptist church, then this is your church. Engage. Jump in. The water's warm. It's okay. You know? and, and jump in and be a part of that fellowship. And then breaking of bread. 
is a reference to the Lord's Supper. Now, COVID has made the Lord's Supper very difficult, very difficult. But we are going to do the Lord's Supper next Sunday. And we're going to do those self-serve, you know, COVID-safe kits and stuff. And so come next Sunday, prepare your hearts. We're going to do Lord's Supper. We were going to do it three, uh, two or three weeks ago, but we had a COVID exposure event in our church, and we had to cancel that at the last minute. But the Lord's Supper is something that we're supposed to do as a church. It's actually a form of worship when we do the Lord's Supper. It's where we are coming together to remember what Jesus did for us. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a way in which we remember and observe and celebrate the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know that we are sinners. We are separated from God by our sin. But God loves us and sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, to shed his innocent blood for us, for you and for me. When we give our hearts and lives to Jesus Christ, we are wonderfully and gloriously saved. And at that point, we get to enjoy a permanent, eternal relationship with our God, starting right here in this life and continuing on into the next life. Every time we observe the Lord's Supper as a church family, we celebrate that. We celebrate what Jesus did. It is a continual reminder. And Jesus commands us to do that. And so next Sunday, you all need to make a priority. You need to make a priority to be here. And if you're online, to gather some elements so you can celebrate the Lord's Supper with us online. It's important. It also is a way for the church to come together and commit to one another under God. It's called communion for a reason. And then prayers. What we did as a church family the other night when we gathered on Wednesday to pray and intercede passionately for Josh is what the church is all about. And we saw God work. We saw God answer those prayers. And he's still working. And we still need to be praying. But that is what we are due. That is what we're supposed to do. That's why it's important for the church, to, for us as Christians to pray individually, and for us as a church to gather together and pray corporately. This Wednesday... We are restarting our in-person Wednesday night prayer meetings for adults. The teenagers and the kids have their own activities going on. But grown-ups, church is important for you too. And so we are going to gather Wednesday night in the auditorium. And we are going to also, for those of you that still aren't comfortable coming out, we're going to have a Zoom, a Zoom availability. So the Zoom link, I believe, is in the newsletter that you received. And we're going to pray. We're restarting that corporate prayer time. I encourage you to make that a priority. Make that a priority. It's also a time we can dig deeper into the Bible, getting back to the apostles' doctrine. Sunday morning, I have to do a lot of milk. You know, to Hebrews talks about milk and meat. Sunday morning, I have to do a lot of milk. Wednesday night, I get to dive into the meat. And so I encourage you to make that a priority. Make that a priority. And in general, with all of these things, the church, make church a priority. Now, I'm going to, I know this can be misunderstood, and some people might be offended, so please hear my heart on this. I don't believe Christians make church anywhere near the priority that it should be. Do you understand that Christians in the first century often risked their lives to go to church? People were willing to die for Christ in the first century. Americans today aren't even willing to get out of bed for the Lord. And, and I know there's a lot in our society that competes with church. And parents, I'm going to say to you, if, if, if your child were to be asked and put on a lie detector, how much of a priority do your parents put on church, what would their answer be? What would their answer be? And parents, how much of a priority is it for you that your children are raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There are many Christian parents, particularly in our society today, that are more committed to their kids getting a college scholarship than they are in their kids having a relationship with Jesus Christ, which is more important. So today I ask you, are you putting the priority on church that God wants you to put on church? There's an old saying that you get out of church, what you put into it, there's a lot of truth to that saying. Let's make sure even if you put some cream and sugar in your coffee, don't forget the coffee. 
Now for me, I don't like coffee, so I'll forget the coffee. But you know, my point is, when it comes to the church, let's not forget what the church is supposed to be all about. All the decisions that we make as, as a church family, the decisions that church leaders make, everything is to be about continuing steadfastly in what the Lord says through his word we should continue steadfastly in. That is our mission. That is what the church is supposed to do. And only in doing that will we truly bring hope and healing to hearts and homes. Would you please join me in a word of prayer as we close out today's service? Father, I thank you for everyone that's here. And Father, I pray that if anyone has a need in their life, if anyone has a challenge, if anyone needs to make a decision that they're not sure where they stand with you, or they need to make a decision for baptism or church membership, or they just need someone to pray with, Lord, I pray that right after I pray, they will come talk to me or Pastor Charles and let us pray with them. But Father, I pray for your blessing on this church family. I thank you that you have shown all of us that you are still in the prayer answering business and you've shown it to us dramatically this month. And Father, I thank you and I praise you for that. I praise you for that. But Father, I pray that you will you know, impress upon us that we're not just to be about a church for particular moments or particular crises, that we're to continue steadfastly in these things week after week after week. I pray that no matter what else may be going on in our life, that we will make your church the priority that you want us to make it so that in the end we can all hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of the week.